ask him that. Take your time with him. Worthy is the Lamb. your language, fill the room with your honor to the Lord. As we move through the night, don't lose your all for the Lord. Let your all stay on fire. No matter where we are in the service, let your all stay on fire for him. For worthy is the Lamb. Lift up your head, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, so the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift your head, O ye gates, and be lifted up, the everlasting doors. Let the King of glory come in. Yeah. Let the King we come in. take over yeah let him take over don't lose your all for him stay enamored even if he's rebuking you stay enamored because he loves those whom he chastises you want that stay enamored God be glorified you may be seated Mm. I have to start with his uniqueness. Um, there really is no other like me. And he tells us to worship him alone because there really is no rival. Um, anything else is a false copy or a, a, um, an insufficient facsimile of who he is. Uh, there's no one else that was there at the beginning of creation when Jesus spoke and made the world, John 1, 1 tells us. Um, when I think about his uniqueness and the fact that everything that is and everything that will be and everything that was came from him, that alone makes him unique. Uh, the old preacher used to say, God is God all by himself. Right? And you think about the aseity of God, the uh, God being ase. When Moses takes off his shoes and stands on holy ground and sees the bush that is uh, representative of this God who exists without any support or help 
or sustenance from anything else, just self-existent. He sees this bush that burns and isn't consumed. Something that burns needs a, a catalyst or a fuel behind it. Um, this bush doesn't need that. Nor is it consumed by itself. It just exists. The first time I heard that, I wanted to run up and down the aisles and slap every single person in the room saying, do you know what this means? Do you know how unique this makes God from all other false gods, Buddha, um, you name them, um, Zoroaster, all of the false gods that claim that they have some sort of supremacy over all things. That alone, in and of itself, makes him unique. And he names himself on the basis of his uniqueness. I'm the provider. I'm the, you, my banner over you is love. I'm the healer. I'm the sustainer. He names himself. And so we've got this beautiful, transcendent, holy God that is like nothing else in this world because it all came from him. Then I think about this eminent God called his son. So we've got this transcendent God that you cannot touch. Nothing unholy can enter its presence. Yet you've got this eminent God, this face of God, this icon, the son of the father, who says, I am holy, but I'm accessible. I can touch him. When he walked the earth, we could walk with him. And then he promises that he's always going to be with us. There's no other like him. There's no rival like the son. And then the Holy Spirit, the Lord gives us the Holy Spirit so that we can be empowered to be holy as he is holy, a set apart people, unique in all the world because we follow the unique one who created the world. We're brought back by the unique one who created the world. We're made perfect by the unique one who created the world. How can I then think that he has any rival? That's to me what it means for God to be holy. <laughs> we done? How are you? This mic on? Can you turn me up? I say tonight. I know it's a mates in here too. I'm gonna say hello to you. Y'all sit down now. It's COVID. I don't want you to mess up your Megan knees. Sit down. All right. How are you? It's good to see y'all. Some of y'all, you know, I know y'all was a little mad that the flyer said DC and we in Virginia. I know. I saw y'all in my inbox. This is the thing. Don't nobody know where no Woodbridge, Virginia is. We got to put D.C. How else will the saints know where to go? <laughs> Anywho, uh, how many of y'all from, from D.C.? What about Maryland or Maryland? It's a bunch of y'all. New York, Jersey. Is, is your house okay? Did it flood? You okay? You all right? You probably needed a break from the water, right? Anywho, I had this uh, friend that used to go to church with me. He's from Baltimore. And, um, hey, hey, sure. Um, it just, <laughs> it was always funny how it's like he didn't know the, the letters TH existed, you know? Like he was talking to me about his family and everybody was bro brother and mother. And I'm like, you mean mother? <laughs> brother. Where, where's the V at? But anywho. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, welcome to glory and all of that. Uh, I got heartburn and my bra is too small. And so, <laughs> I, I just feel like something going to pop out at any moment. Um, and so just pray, pray that the Lord keeps me and us. Uh, I never said that before. It's literally, I just, I didn't pack the right one. And so I'm just kind of stressed. The, the intention behind this conference is simple. It's that 
I wanted to create a space where God is central. Uh, I've been to a lot of women conferences, and many of them are good. Most of them are terrible. Um, and this is, there's two reasons why. One is there's a, lot, a lack of theological depth where uh, it seems as if they presume that because we are women, we can't go deep. And so I, I have no intention of just preaching Proverbs 31 to you. Or, and it's in the Bible. It's still profitable for training and correction and, and rebuke and all that. Uh, <laughs> but we do have the capacity as women to, to, to dive deep into texts that usually are reserved for the men. Two, uh, I'm trying. Um, <laughs> another thing that tends to be lacking is that there is this addiction to only using the Bible as a platform to tell you about yourself. I have no desire to do that um, because you learning about yourself won't change you. You learning about yourself won't convert you. You learning about yourself won't fill you with the Holy Ghost. Uh, but you learning about God, that makes all the difference. And so that's the goal here, is to root you in something deep and true and scriptural and theological that also exalts and centers and points to the God that created us for himself. That's the whole point, and that's why it's called glory. Uh, and so I pray uh, that God will do what he does. Uh, let's do that. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to speak about God um, and to, to be honest in it. Um, it, is, it is really easy to articulate truths about God and live like the devil. And so I'm grateful that you have even changed my heart in such a way that I'm talking about who I believe I know. Um, I pray, God, that you would empower me with power, with freedom prophetically, uh, with humility. I pray for insight and wisdom and direction. Also pray for your people and those who you are calling to be your people, that your spirit would be present in our midst, that he will do what he does, which is to illuminate your scriptures so that we can understand them. They are spiritually discerned, so we need your help to make sense of what it is that you've said about yourself. But we also need the power to believe it, and we need the power to trust it. I pray even, God, that you would bring to our minds our idols, all the things that get in the way of us actually fully surrendering to you, all the things uh, that get in the way of us loving you truly, especially those who have been with you for a long time. We think we've made it, but we're not in glory yet. And so I pray, God, that you even reveal those little foxes, the, the little leaven, the, the, the little sins that we have uh, nursed and coddled for so long that we can't even discern that it's a problem. So I pray, God, uh, that you would help us. I pray all your grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, I'm hot already. Uh, one quote, you can turn me up a little bit, that has always stuck with me is a quote by A.W. Tozer that says, what comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. And, and I don't know if we think like that often, but we should because in all the craziness in the world, in all the craziness within ourselves, what is really happening and what we're really seeing is symptomatic of what we believe about God. For example, if, if you believe God is creator, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth then you will rightly behave like a creature, meaning you will embrace dependence. But more often than not, we will confess that God is creator, but we will function like we are. And that's why we hate our limitations. That's, that's why we hate our neediness. It's why we resist being vulnerable. It's why we resist being weak. It's because we want to be as independent of everything like God is. And because we cannot overcome our lot as creatures, we at least try to find ways to experience a God-likeness. For example, social media. In the exchange of the truth about God, 
for the lie that social media can become. Every like feels like praise. Every follow feels like heaven. Every comment feels like prayer. And I'm not totally, you know, putting shade on social media because that's the reason you're even here. <laughs> but I do think that our addiction to it is revealing. And I think it's because one reason is that we, when we get on social media, whether that's Twitter, whether it's Instagram, whether it's Facebook or whatever, uh, we, we feel as if we know everything without having to ask anybody anything, mimicking omniscience. We, we have the freedom to go places, to fly to, to lands we've never seen. We get access into people's homes and to their families, into their thoughts by way of their words and their caption, uh, captions, mimicking omnipresence. It's as if social media has given us a way to be the creator, but it's a lie. What we believe about God is revealed in the way we live our lives. If we truly believe that God is creator, we will gladly embrace our creatureliness. The world has a lot of definitions for God. For some, he is the universe. For others, he is only the father and not also the son and spirit. You have some saints that think he is present within sage. Now your house smell like dressing and you think it's delivered you of some spirits. You just, it's just seasoning. They think they're cleansing their house and they're still fornicating. It's confusing. Anywho. It's a big deal how we define God. Because if and when we choose to believe how the world defines God, then we won't leave any room for God to define himself. We will let our circumstances, our friends, our feelings, our passions, TikTok, tell us what to believe. And if their assessments aren't true, that means that their definitions are demonic. So you'll think that you have somehow found or discovered truth when you have simply believed the doctrines of demons is deep. And so my plan tonight is to cut through the deception, to cut through the noise and allow God to speak as explained in his word, as revealed in his son and as illuminated by the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Bible has a whole lot to tell us about God. It tells us that he's king, it tells us that he's creator tells us that he's Lord, tells us that he's sovereign. And one thing that we need to know that we know about God is that he is also holy. And if that does not come into your mind when you think about God, then it should. Turn or click in your Bibles to Isaiah 6. Say amen when you get there. When I was growing up in church, this, this time used to give me anxiety. <laughs> because it's like, I got to go to the table of contents. I'm not sure where Isaiah is. I know where Psalms is, not Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two, he covered his face, and with two, he covered his feet, and with two, he flew, and one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, 
the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. The prophet Isaiah saw the Lord on a throne. And he heard the seraphim singing something doctrinal about the nature of God. To one another, they praised God by saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. If the seraphim were somehow replaced by people within our current cultural context, I do believe that the lyrics might be a bit different. I have a feeling that if we gave somebody the supernatural ability to leave earth, enter heaven, stand in the throne, and ask them, hey, sing something about the nature of God, they would open up their mouth and out of it would come, love, love, love is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And if they did, they wouldn't be lying. Because God is love. He said so himself. But the question that one should ask themselves is, would God be love if God wasn't holy? I mean, without righteousness permeating his entire being, setting him apart from all that is self-serving, all that is self-protecting, all that is uh, self-centered uh, and abusive, if there was no moral purity in God, would he be able to love you at all? That's why it's interesting, and I think it, it makes sense then, why when the seraphim have to sing and do sing about the nature of God, what they sing about is God's holiness. But notice they don't say it once, they don't say it twice, and they don't even say it uh, uh, two and a half times. They say it three times, holy, holy, holy. In Hebrew literature, repetition is used to emphasize something, such as when Jesus wanted to emphasize the truthfulness of his statement, he would say, truly, truly, or verily, verily, if you got a KJV. <laughs> Black people, we do the same thing. When we see somebody we know and we tell a friend about it, we say, hey, I saw David. She says, David who? David, David, it's, it's the repetition. <laughs> we, we think it's gonna trigger a memory by, by repeating ourselves. We, We've been biblical the whole time, and we didn't even know it. <laughs> so, so in saying that God is thrice holy, that means that the seraphim are trying to prove a point. They're trying to tell you something about the holiness of God. If you, if you look throughout Scripture, you will never see another attribute of God used to the third power except this one. Which means that God is not merely holy. But God is most holy, supremely holy, utterly holy, completely holy. But what does holy even mean? Well, the way my early church experience was set up, holiness meant a few things, but mainly it was that God is holy, you're a sinner, you disobey, you're going to hell. It also meant you didn't go nowhere with your legs out unless you had some white stockings. Also meant... You didn't play cards, still don't understand that one. I couldn't play Uno, couldn't play Spades, couldn't play Jim Rummy. We could play Connect Four, because that's not cards. <laughs> then it seemed like holy people talked about hell all the time. Let's say you just laugh at the wrong joke. They say, how you going to laugh your way straight to hell? Why I got to go straight there? <laughs> how you know ain't no cul-de-sacs on the way? I can't make a left and a right. I got to just go straight. I got to be efficient on my way to hell. It's a stressful thing, it's stressful. I was going to the altar all the time. So, I don't wanna to go to hell, Father. So, in my mind, holiness was only about rule keeping and wrath. And I think that most of us at one point, if you grew up in church, might have had this experience, and if so, then that means you have had a narrow and most likely negative framework of the term holy. And if so, that means that if that is the case, then it has affected how you view and thus interact with God. Because if by holy we only mean restriction and not also freedom. 
or wrath and never mercy. Then when you hear that God is holy, 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 it doesn't move you to worship. The root word of the term holy means to cut or to separate. Overall, it conveys the idea of separateness. We see it used for the first time in Genesis 2 when God blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy or sanctified it, meaning that God set the Sabbath day apart. He separated it from all other days, making it unique, making it special and one of a kind. Uh, there's an example by Tony Evans that I like to use, and he talks about how in every house there's two, time, two, two kinds of dishes. How there's the dishes that you, you know, they're just regular. You just, you probably got them from Target or Walmart. I don't know which one, every one did you think. Maybe five below if y'all got that here at the dollar store. And you just don't do nothing with them. You, you eat fries on them or chicken Alfredo. I don't know. You just, they're just not special. Even when you clean them, you just throw them in the cabin. You don't even care about them. But on certain days, you bring out these other kinds of dishes. You got these dishes from like Hobby Lobby or Pottery Barn somewhere. You got these from Granny. These ain't, these ain't no regular Ross TJ Maxx Marshalls dishes. These got the little designs on the edge and all that type of stuff. And, and, and some of the saints, depending on the age, they have what you call a china cabinet, meaning after you done ate, they don't even put these dishes with the regular ones. They put them in a whole nother room in a whole nother city in a whole nother country in the same house. Because these dishes are different. These dishes are treated different because they're set apart. These dishes, metaphorically speaking, are holy. So, so when the seraphim are singing about the holiness of God, they are not singing about rules and they are not singing about wrath. They are making a, making a, a hymn around the basic idea that God is totally set apart. With the Sabbath, it was a day set apart from all other days. With celebratory dishes, they are, they are dishes that are set apart from other dishes. But the question we have to ask ourselves is, if God is holy, who or what is he set apart from? The answer is everything. God is set apart, unique and different from everything that has and will ever exist. To say it another way, God is in a class all by himself. There are two distinct categories in which God's nature sets him apart from everything. They are his transcendence and his moral purity. Transcendence means a cut above. So, some of us have wig, wigs that are transcendent because it's not it's, it's a cut above our scalp. It just ain't sitting there. I'm sorry, I had to say it. I can see the braids, sis. But, um, God... <laughs> I got like 16 jokes, I'm trying to stay holy. Um, God is transcendent because he exists ontologically different than us. Meaning his, his being is transcendent, his being is different. God is also morally pure, meaning he is, he is always righteous. He, he has no spots, he, he has no blemish, he is supremely clean, he is, he is all good. And we are going to observe both God's moral purity and God's transcendence in Isaiah's vision of him, starting at verse one. He says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. King Uzziah became the king of Judah at the age of 16 after his father Amaziah died. From there, he reigned 52 whole years. That's a long time and a lot can happen in 52 years. It's 2021 and 52 years ago was, uh, it feels like 2019, but 52 years ago was really 1969. That year, Neil Armstrong landed on the moon. 
There, there was Woodstock and Stonewall riots. Uh, Richard Nixon was president and my mama was a whole 15 years old. It's weird to imagine it really. Since then, we have had 10 presidents. The Woodstock generation is getting their retirement coin and my mama has a 32 year old daughter with three children and one on the way. Pray both of their strength in the Lord when you get time. The, the thing is, the scope of 52 years seems so long, so, so, so much can happen in that time, but even then, everything still must come to an end, including King. 52 years into King Uzziah's reign, his heart stopped and he breathed his last. And Isaiah says that the year that King Uzziah dies is the same year that he sees another king alive and well. And what does this have to do with holiness? Well, God isn't holy just because he was seen alive. God is transcendent, holy, because he has always been alive. Before Uzziah and his daddy, before Abraham and Moses, before Cain and Abel, before Adam and Eve, before animals and plants, before the sun and the moon, before stars, before time, before the world, before matter, before space, before everything, God was alive. I'm sure at least five of you have had a child look you in your face and say, hey, mama, TT teacher, uh, did God create the world? And you feel all theological. You're like, yeah, Genesis 1, sure he did. <laughs> they say, God created me, and you still feel all encouraged. Yeah, he knit you in his womb. <laughs> and they hit you with the boom bop. They say, but who created God? Now you feel slow. <laughs> but it's, a, it's an intelligent question if you think about it, because the child is taking a survey of everything that they know, and they recognize that everything, including them, has a beginning. That everything is made. That everything is created. But when we get to God, he is the only one that requires a different answer. Point to anything in the world, and better believe it is a derivative of something. It is contingent, meaning something had to be here for it to exist. Your mama and your daddy had to be here for you to be made. Uh, Steve Jobs had to be here for Apple and iPhones to be created. Glory be to God. Farms have to be here for there to be meals. Musicians need instruments. Artists need paint. Uh, the thing is, everything is dependent on something else for it to exist. Because we are created, every, every single one of us is inherently dependent. That's why we fight against it so much. Paul says that it is in God that we live and move and have our being. What does that mean? It means that without God, you would not be. Without God, you not, would not be alive or have life. Without God, you wouldn't even be able to move. But unlike us, God doesn't need anything to live and move and have his being. All God needs is himself. God has power he doesn't have to borrow. Strength he doesn't have to work for. Wisdom he didn't have to learn. Foresight nobody had to prophesy. A child may not understand it, and, and some adults might not either, but if someone asks you who created God, the only answer you could give is that God exists because God exists. That's what he meant by I am who I am. Are you starting to see why God is transcendent and how God is different from you, that there is truly nobody like him? When Isaiah sees the Lord, he also observes that the Lord is seated on the throne that is high and lifted up. You might make, think that means uh, altitude. In one way it might be. But it's not simply that of geographical position, but of that of preeminence. The height of God's throne speaks 
to the supremacy of God's nature. So what Isaiah sees reveals the excellence of God's being. God is seen as high and lifted up because God is superior over all. God is the most high. God is exalted over everything. His ways are high and higher because he is. And because God is supreme over all, preeminent over all, exalted over all. It means that even if something is good, it could never be God because it ain't good enough. Everything wonderful that you have ever known, love and food and sex and good wigs and laughter and friends and parents and children and sleep and gas money, name it. That's a good thing. Unless you got a Tesla, glory be to God. Any good thing you have ever had or will ever have will never complete, compete with the supremacy of God. As this high and lifted up God is seated, with his robe stretching throughout the temple, Isaiah observes these heavenly creatures around the throne. He calls them seraphim which is translated as burning ones. So it's, it's possible and likely that they looked like flames with wings. And he describes them by saying that each of them had six wings. With two, they covered their eyes. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they flew. In which if we were honest with ourselves, if one flew in here, we might be tempted to curse because we'd be so scared. But I do think that the strangeness of these creatures and even the ones that are uh, uh, talked about in Revelation, I think it tells us something about the otherness of God. But as these creatures flew, they sang. Isaiah 6 is a hymn. They sang to one another about the holiness of God. And as this happened, the temple began to shake, which typically happens when God is around creation, when, when God shows up, things move, including you. So, in the room, in the temple, there's this high and lifted up Lord, and the temple is trembling. The room fills with smoke, and the burning ones are singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And notice in the text, Isaiah doesn't add to their praise. He doesn't lift up his hand and worship. He doesn't open up his mouth and give God glory. It's as if by impulse, while the burning ones testify to the holy nature of God, while in his presence, surrounded by smoke and a shaking temple, beholding the awesome glory of God, the only thing that Isaiah can do in this moment is confess. He says, woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips. When I read this passage, I thought to myself, why woe instead of worship? And it's because God doesn't only exist differently than us. He's not only transcendent in his holiness, but he is also morally pure. It is truly hard to imagine a being that can only be good, only do right, only think righteously. With God, there is no darkness, no evil within him, no, no blemished heart or unclean hands. Imagine if you can a being with motives Satan can never influence. A being whose behavior will never require atonement. A being that is too good to be true, but truly he is that good. God is holy, holy, holy. What's problematic about our nature, though, is that in our unbelief, we tend to project our nature onto God by either accusing him of sinfulness 
or behaving in such a way where we implicitly believe that he is. We, we talk about him as if he's unjust just because he allowed suffering in your marriage. Just because he allowed life to get hard, we start having all these accusations about God as if he's not good when everything is bad. We open up his word and refuse to believe it as if God could lie to us. But who I've described is actually more like Satan than it is God. But who do you think we are imaging God as when our, when our definitions of God exclude his holiness? It's as if we think Satan is who Isaiah saw and not God. The interesting thing is, is that when Jesus was on the earth, he was always, not always, consistently accused of being a sinner. That he partnered with Satan to cast out demons. That he was a glutton. That he was a drunkard. That he was a blasphemer. And in John 8, Jesus asked an important question. He said, which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell you the truth, why don't you believe me? This is a profound statement because no human being on earth could ask this question and be considered in their right mind. Because every person alive can be convicted of sin except Jesus. So what Jesus is doing is that he is calling attention to his moral purity as the reason why he is worthy of their faith. Because it is what we believe about God that will determine how we behave. If we don't believe that God is good all the time and all the time God is good, then we wonder why we trust everybody else to be good for us. You don't have sex with people you aren't married to just because you're lustful. You also do it because you don't believe that God is Lord of your body. Another angle of that, you, you don't have sex with people you're not married to just because you're lustful. You also do it because you don't believe God is the source of all comfort. You believe that man is. You, you didn't take the job God told you not to just because you're disobedient. That's an element. But underneath that, you did it because you didn't believe that God could provide for you at a lower pay wage. Do you see the connection I'm trying to make? Is that all of our sin, at, at the root of it, is unbelief in the word and worth of God. And that is why it is so hard for us to be holy sometimes because we keep trying to modify our behavior without dealing with the belief systems at the root of it. And I have a suspicion. I think that one reason faith and therefore holiness is difficult for us apart from total depravity, is that because we have experienced all kinds of inconsistency and dishonesty and unfaithfulness and, and suffering in our world, that we live in this world in a, in a constant state of self-preservation, protecting ourselves from the potential of pain, protecting ourselves from the potential of uh, uh, trauma and hurt. And I wonder if unbelief are un underneath our doubt and underneath our unbelief, I, I wonder if way at the bottom of it is a suspicion that God isn't safe either. That God is just like the father that left us. Just like the mother that didn't emotionally nurture us. Just like the friend that didn't listen to us. Just like the people in positions of power that abused us. It's, it's so, so when God reveals himself then as a heavenly father, as a faithful friend, as a Lord, we don't relinquish control because we have mistakenly projected onto God the nature of everybody that has sinned against us. It's deep. But understand this, if God is holy, it means he cannot sin. And if God cannot sin, it means he cannot sin against you. And if God cannot sin against you, doesn't that make him the most trustworthy being that exists? Our faith in the holiness of God would eliminate a lot of idols in our lives. A holy God is a God who is without fault. 
without blemish, without wrinkle. Habakkuk says his eyes are too pure to look on sin. Peter said that Jesus committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. First John says that in him there is no sin, but there was sin in Isaiah. He was born after Adam. Therefore, he had a nature that wasn't holy but blemished, wasn't righteous but dark. And in the presence of this holy, holy, holy God, there was, there was nowhere for his heart to hide. It's so interesting to me that God is so pure that when anything unlike him is near him, it becomes obvious that they're not him. And it ain't like God did anything for Isaiah to be terrified. God didn't even tell Isaiah he was holy, the seraphim did. God didn't even move, didn't sit up, didn't adjust his feet. He simply sat, and that was enough for Isaiah to see his wickedness. And this is because as the morally pure God, God is also light. First John says this, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Light is a, a metaphor for righteousness. So when considering why Isaiah chose woe over worship, we have to think about the activity of light. When you're in the dark room and you don't know what's in it, what you do? You pull out your phone, bring out the flashlight so you can see it. When you got dark bags on the eyes, what do you do? You get some highlighter. Some of us. Light illuminates. It exposes whatever is in the dark and brings it to the surface. That's why the Bible says that anyone that loves evil hates the light because of this. They hate the light lest their work should be exposed. Well, by the throne of the Holy One, the supreme virtue of God's very being forced everything in Isaiah that did not look like God to come out of hiding. For some of us, this illuminating effect causes us to be defensive unteachable, manipulative, and it's because light exposes your sin, therefore it exposes your weaknesses. And instead of opting for the vulnerability of humility, we prefer to maintain the false view of ourselves that we have constructed, and by doing so, we may have protected our image in front of church folk, but we have resisted God's hand in the process, whoa. Conviction is a mercy. Because when it's not present, it might be that you're given over. Notice that in the presence of the holy God, Isaiah was honest. And why shouldn't he be? God knows everything. He knew that Isaiah was a man of unclean lips, and now Isaiah did too. By seeing God, Isaiah saw himself. And by confessing the uncleanness of his heart, Isaiah was also acknowledging, uh, no, by uh, confessing the uncleanness of his lips, Isaiah was also acknowledging the uncleanness of his heart because it is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth. But notice that eventually he, he doesn't acknowledge the guilt of people before he acknowledges his own. He deals with his stuff before he points to everybody else. Eventually acknowledging the guilt of his community by saying, yes, I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. If Isaiah were like most of us, we probably wouldn't have mentioned our sin of all. We would have been like, God, I'm a little ratchet, sorry, but them people <laughs> down there. But he doesn't do that because self-righteousness is only possible when you compare your behavior to everyone else's. But when and if the comparison is between you and God, who's perfect, the only real response you can have is humility. But Isaiah's in a predicament now. He has seen the holy, holy, holy God, and for that reason, he has seen himself. He has seen that God is both supreme and morally superior, and therefore God is also a judge. This is why when Isaiah pronounced woe on himself, which is an expression of grief or despair, he also said, I am lost, which doesn't convey the thrust of the Hebrew. By lost, he means ruined. By lost, he means destroyed. 
which means that he is not only acknowledging his sin, but he is also very aware of what his sin deserves, which is the judgment of a righteous God. And what does holiness have to do with God's justice? Everything. If God is holy, he must be just. And in so doing, he must punish sinners. And God's self-revelation to Moses in Exodus 34, he says that he will by no means clear the guilty. Because when God sees sin, he doesn't see himself. Him being most beautiful. And it confuses us. That the same God that is praised for his kindness can seem so cruel. But as he is transcendent and therefore different than us, his wrath is not to be compared to the anger that we know of by experience. Wrath isn't a response to God's ego being bruised because he doesn't have one. John Murray said this, the wrath of God is a holy revulsion of God's being against that which is a contradiction to his holiness. God cannot be indifferent towards sin because God is too holy, holy, holy to do so. For if he were to overlook the guilty, he would be like the people we protest. He would be unjust. He would not be holy. God must judge the guilty no matter how small the offense may be, and we only call it small when we don't understand how holy he is. All sins are big sins. Our society tends to accuse God of injustice whenever his gavel falls too hard for our liking. And it's because we have a low view of sin and a mediocre understanding of the holiness of God. Isaiah said he was lost just because of his words. Imagine how much judgment our Twitter timeline deserves then. God is holy, holy, holy. Sin is offensive, abominable, demonic, unrighteous, and out of God's law, he has delivered to us something they delivered to us a law that if we just obeyed it, we would be just as beautiful as he is, but we will not allow it. So then God must do what is right. God must judge. God must lift up his sword and bring it down on the guilty. But here's the question that should be asked but never is. If the holy God must judge sinners, why am I still alive? Aren't I a woman of unclean lips? And don't I dwell in a city, in a community, in a country, and in a world of unclean lips? Am I any different from Adam? Haven't I eaten several fruit that God told me not to eat? Haven't I sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? And yet, here I am. in a conference with clothes on my back and breath in my lungs, your life is a mercy. The truth is, we are so used to the patience of God that we are more shocked by his judgments than we are by his mercy. You know how people say God is gracious in the New Testament and he's wrath in the Old Testament. They're not reading the Bible. For every story in the scriptures, especially in the Old Testament, where there is wrath, there is also mercy. Consider Genesis 3. After Adam sinned, an animal was slaughtered and sacrificed to cover him and his wife's shame, mercy. Consider Israel and Egypt. At the same time that the Egyptians were being judged, 
Israel was rescued only because God found pleasure in communicating their deliverance. The blood on the doorpost was not their idea. They didn't ask for that. They didn't come up with that. God did mercy. Consider Lot who when Sodom and Gomorrah was being judged, he was rescued on the basis not of his righteousness, but God's mercy. Consider Isaiah, who even in this text, if you look at it, he doesn't even ask God for forgiveness. Look at verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had, he had taken with tongues from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Hmm. Interesting. Right after Isaiah confessed his sin to the Lord, one of the heavenly creatures stopped singing. He grabbed the burning coal from the altar, placed it on Isaiah's mouth, sanctifying it, as a, as sanctifying it for holy use since he was a prophet. But do you see Isaiah asks for that? Do you see him say, hey, God, can you atone for my sin? Do you even see, hey, God, what can I do to get that cold to touch my mouth? You, you don't see him do anything to try to merit it, to try to earn it. Because what could he do? No matter how long he shouted, no how many tongues he spoke in, no, 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 no matter how many tithes he paid, there was nothing he could work up to the perfection and the standard and the measure that is God for him to earn salvation. God's standard is too high. You cannot atone for yourself. But even though he did not ask for it, the seraphim came and took his guilt away anyway. Which is to say, what happened in the throne room is what has happened to everyone whose sins have been atoned for, is that God initiated mercy before you even asked him to. Do we not remember the text? While I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. He did the work before you even came to the knowledge that you needed it. How? Oh. Let's use our sanctified imagination for a moment. You know, pads anoint the message. See, it just got saved in here. You ain't see it? Imagine that you, me, us, we are the seraphim. We are the burning one. And since we were created, all we've done is worship around the throne. And it's not even that we were given a script. It's just that every time we see God, we can't help but take one set of wings and cover our eyes because his glory is too, too brilliant to behold. And we can't help but take another set of wings and cover our feet because the ground on which he sits is holy ground. And if we could use the other set of wings to worship, we would, but we need them to fly. And all day and night, all we do is sing. And the song is simple. I don't remember which one of us made it up, but we sing it because it's true. Because if, if you look at him and remember all that he's done, that when he made the heavens, he was holy. That when he made the earth, he was holy. That when he made the stars, he was holy. That when he, when he made us, he was holy. That when he, when he made man, he was holy. All he has ever done and all he has ever been is holy. So what better song is there to sing than what God, a song that tells God what he already knows about himself? One day though, everything changed and we saw one of the Lord's feet moved. And then the other one moved and we saw him start to roll up his, his robe. And the more we paid attention, we realized that the king was getting up. And we all started to fly 
to one another to see if anybody could tell us what, where the Lord was going and if we might need our help. So we asked one of the seraphs that's cool with Michael the Archangel because Michael knows all the things. And we asked, what is, what is the Lord doing? Why is the Lord getting up? And the, the seraph said, the father is sending him somewhere. We were like, oh, he must be going to the other side of heaven because his robe been on the floor for a long time. So he just wants to get a new one. And the seraph said, no, the father is sending him to earth to become a man. And we were like, a, a man? How? He's God. This is, this is the Lord of hosts we're talking about. This is the ancient of days. This is the beginning and end. This is the alpha and omega. This is the creator of heaven and earth. How, how and why in the world is he becoming one of them? Those humans that love everybody else but him. Those people that deny him when he calls, deny him when confronted. Those people that sin against him just because they're bored. Why, why in the world is he becoming one of them? We didn't understand why the Lord would get up from his seat to live among men. And the seraph looked at us and said, the Lord loves them. So he must become like them. He will still be God, but he will also be man. But don't worry, he will be back. You might be wondering why I am attributing Isaiah's vision of God to Jesus. I do it because in John 12, verse 41, he says about Jesus that John, well, John in verse 41 says that Isaiah saw Jesus's glory and spoke of him. Spoke of who? The Father? No. The Spirit? No. Isaiah saw Jesus's glory and spoke of him. What I'm saying is that in the year that King Uzziah died, the Lord seated on the throne, high and lifted up with, with the train of his robe filling the temple, being called holy, holy, holy is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ that we call friend. That who Isaiah is seeing is our Messiah. That who Isaiah is seeing is our Savior, which means that 2,000 years ago, the transcendent, eternal, valuable, worthy, supreme, just God got up from his seat to sit down among us. And being found in human form, he emptied himself by becoming obedient to the point of death and even death on a cross. Therefore, it is God who has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name. So at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Isaiah might not have imagined that one day the holy God would pronounce woe on himself. Being ruined, being lost so that we could be found being destroyed, destroyed so that we could be risen again, becoming lost so that we could be found by God and rising again to sit in his rightful place on the throne. I know it's a lot of people in the world that want us to think that everything else and everybody else is more worthy of our time, more worthy of our body, more worthy of our mind, more worthy of our money, more worthy of our sexuality, more worthy of our home, more worthy of our marriage than God is, but it's a lie. Why? Because there's nobody like him. There's, there's nobody that can compare to him. There, there's nobody that can compete with him. He, he has no rivals. He, he has nobody that's anything like who he is. I, I know we're in this place where everybody is falling away from their faith. But I have no choice but to stay holding on to mine. Why? Because where else am I going to go? <laughs> Who else has the words of eternal life? 
Who else is able to deliver you? Who else is able to save you? Who else is able to heal you? Who else is able to comfort you? Who else is God? Who else is good? Who else is kind? Who else is righteous? Who else is just? Who else is glorified? Who else is alpha? Who else is omega? much else to say. If I could hoop, I would, but I, I got a limit. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm socially awkward. I, I get anxiety. I guess before or when Jordan comes out, she's going to lead us in a significant time of worship because I want you to have the space to meet with God. always try to imagine what I would say or what I should say if this is the last time I would speak with you or if it would be the last time you were able to sit under any teaching knowing that our life is really short I, I guess what I would say is that God is is better than you could ever imagine. And you cannot depend on your flesh to make you believe that that's true. The world would have you think that God is just a good option. But he's God. He's good. He's kind. He's real, he's wise, he's alive. And I lament that in places like America, our prosperity has lied to us and made us think that we are sufficient and satisfied without him. This is why we don't read. This is why we don't pray. This is why we don't fight. Coming to a conference is not fighting. It's trusting in what God has revealed about himself once you leave, that is. So if you need to repent, do that. What is repentance? Repentance is recognizing that every idol you have, everything that you trust in and love more than God, is unable to be God for you. It's recognizing and reconciling yourself with reality and saying that sin is not worth it. Sin will not satisfy. And I'm talking to Christians too. You notice most of Paul's warnings were for the church. Don't be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor swindlers, nor drunkards will inherit the kingdom of God. But such were some of you. So turn from it and believe in the Lord Jesus. I'm not saying depend on a feeling because if you're waiting to feel faithful, you'll never be faithful. Faithfulness is a decision that you make based on the truth that God has revealed about himself. So get what you need. Lord, I thank you for yourself. I thank you for your son. Thank you for your spirit. I thank you that you are always pursuing us. You are always coming for us. <laughs> you are always speaking to us. You are always providing for us. You are always being yourself towards us. And I pray that you would open up our understanding and our heart to take a hold of that truth. I pray for the women in this room that you would meet them in a special and unique way. I pray for those who are resistant to the presence of the Spirit, whether it be by conviction, whether it be the experience of emotions. We are whole beings, both mind and body. Feelings are not evil. And so I pray for those of us that need to cry that we would. 
those of us that need to lament, that we would. Those of us that need to confess our anger towards you, that we would. But I pray in the meantime that you would also fill us up, that we would not leave this place empty, but we would leave restored. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen.